60 years ago, on the first Sunday of September 1939, Britain was finally at war. The summer holidays were at an end. A whole nation sensed that whatever the outcome, life in Britain would never be the same again. It is now the duty of every citizen to know what to do should an air raid come. Do you know the warning signals? To remind you, we repeat them, but softly. Most people thought that Hitler had to be stopped, but a few saw the lost peace as a tragedy. They believed, as some still believe, that Britain should have kept out of the war. The Second World War is hailed as Britain's finest hour. The decision to fight is seen as necessary, inevitable and right. But this is the story of those who preferred conciliation to confrontation. I think going to war against Hitler was a mistake. Had we stayed out, it's interesting to reflect on the fact that the Russians would have beaten the Germans on their own, and we would not have been involved in a war, which resulted, as Hitler predicted, in the loss of the British Empire and the creation of two superpowers, the United States and the Soviet Union, and nearly 400,000 British dead. In 1938, a large majority had thought that going to war with Hitler would be a mistake. As we travelled back with Mr Chamberlain, we drove through serried masses of happy people, happy in the knowledge that there was no war with Germany. The Premier drove Arriving back from Paris. Munich, Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain had been hailed as a national hero. He had prevented a European war by letting Hitler take parts of Czechoslovakia. Compromise seemed better than conflict. Throughout the 1930s, pacifism had flourished. Only 20 years before, two and a half million Britons had been killed or wounded in the First World War. And its lessons were still fresh in everyone's mind. No one believed more strongly than Neville Chamberlain that another war should be avoided at almost any cost. My grandfather, of course, lived through the First World War. He had a, a cousin um, of whom he was extremely fond, who was killed in that war. Uh, he saw from himself the devastation that the war caused um, and the effect that it had on families um, <coughs> uh, and the young men of, of the country at the time. So that I think he developed almost an instinct that such a dreadful conflict should never be suffered again. The whole effort of British diplomacy was directed towards preventing war in Europe. Working on the papers of the people in the Foreign Office and in the Cabinet, one comes again and again to the uh, conclusion that everybody on the uh, British side really wanted to avoid this war if at all possible. The great turning point came in March 1939 when many Britons concluded that we would have to fight. It looked as though the fate of Europe would be decided not by the diplomats, but by the soldiers. Once again, the rattle of a German army on the march echoes in Europe. Where that march may end, no man can foretell, least of all the man who gave the order. Hitler had broken his promise to Chamberlain at Munich that he only wanted German-speaking areas of Czechoslovakia. Now he was grabbing much more and taking non-Germans into the Reich for the first time. About 10 o'clock, the first troops started to arrive in Prague. The Germans came in. They were really looking magnificent, sitting bolt upright in the uh, troop carriers, looking straight ahead and apparently quite oblivious of the misery and the disaster that they were causing. Peter Wilkinson was a British Army officer at the legation in Prague. During the invasion, he collected military intelligence. 
I was spending a lot of time photographing the various German equipment, the anti-tank guns, the headquarter vehicles, etc., etc., with my Leica. Nobody tried to constrain me or stop me. Later that afternoon, some of the Germans actually posed for me in front of their vehicles. But it was altogether the saddest sight that you could imagine. In Britain, the question after Prague was whether we could ever trust Hitler again. People were torn by contradictory emotions. Coming back to London was very strange. There was an enormous sense of shock, I think, because a great many people had taken Hitler's assurances to Mr. Chamberlain at their face value. And uh, it, uh, they had expected that there was to be no war in our time, whereas now the threat loomed very large indeed. But I think for the ordinary people, uh, the idea, they, there was really a confidence, I would say, that uh, something would turn up, like the Munich Conference. Really, to some extent, it was a nine days wonder that life went on very much as before. Crocuses in Hyde Park don't always mean that spring's in the air. Some years, rain or even snow falls and ruins the view. But March 1939 has made a good start, and good weather in Britain is always new. Despite Hitler's invasion of Czechoslovakia, there were still those that thought war could and must be avoided. After Prague, there were a large number of people on all sides of the political spectrum who believed that peace was an ideal that still should be pursued. They ranged from the Duke of Windsor on the right to left-wing MPs. There were a lot of businessmen who thought that their own interests were involved in an economic deal with Hitler. Uh, there were peers of the realm who felt that they would suffer. The diarist Harold Nicholson has a wonderful account in his diary of meeting three young uh, noblemen in his club who said to him and appalled him by saying so that they would rather see Hitler in London than the socialists in power. The Foreign Office had responsibility for dealing with Germany and the diplomats had a daunting task if they were to avoid war. What they saw themselves involved in was the most delicate, the most dangerous set of diplomatic manoeuvres that had happened since 1914 and like their predecessors before the outbreak of war in 1914 what they were looking for was a way of using the diplomatic process to reach a solution. Within the Foreign Office they disagreed about how best to deal with Hitler. Should they try to deter him with threats or placate him with concessions? The Foreign Secretary, Lord Halifax, thought they should be more aggressive towards him. But his junior minister, Rad Butler, feared this would provoke war. The diary of Butler's parliamentary private secretary, Chips Channon, reveals their efforts to pursue a policy of conciliation. My father says on the 23rd of March in his diaries that I that's him, my father, was able to tone down the PM's reply to a question about our attitude to recent events. I'd seen the flimsy, and when I handed it to him, he said, I said, it's pretty stiff. I suppose it's got to be. He agreed, but with a pencil, he altered a few stinging lines. I encouraged him, though he didn't need it. I hastily typed out two copies of the amended statement, which might easily prevent or postpone war rather than precipitate it. It doesn't actually attack Germany, and now throws the grammar into the subjunctive. Perhaps I've made history, or prevented it, which is often more important. Officials who agreed with Chernan argued that there was no moral duty to get involved in a European war. They maintained British interests were not directly threatened by Hitler. Former diplomat Sir Roy Denman takes the same line today. He believes 1939 was not the time to confront Hitler. I mean, if you find yourself in a forest with a fierce tiger prowling around, uh, without any particular intention of eating you, the sensible thing is to lie doggo. Uh, if you try and seize the tiger and wrench off its tail, um, the tiger will then get nasty and probably eat you up. <laughs> 
If we have equipped yourself with a rocket launcher and various machine guns, you might be able to deal with that situation. If all you have is a penknife, um, the tiger will turn, not only turn nasty, but uh, do you in. A majority of the Fleet Street newspapers of the time thought the same. Their editorials pronounced that a deal could still be done with Hitler. The day after the invasion of Prague, the London Evening Standard came out with an editorial saying, well, Czechoslovakia was a ramshackle state, it was bound to fall to pieces, uh, it had, this invasion has nothing to do with us, and um, we certainly don't regard it as a cause of war. The Times, while being outraged by what had happened, also took the line that cooperation was possible and that, in the last resort, we could always appeal to the conscience of the German people. But public opinion was changing. The press barons were getting out of step with their readers and even some of their own journalists. Lord Beaverbrook took on a new writer from the socialist paper Tribune, the young Michael Foote. Beaverbrook, in his Express and indeed his other newspapers, was uh, uh, opposed to Britain being involved in the war in any kind of way, and he was... Uh, and a, an appeaser supporting the Chamberlain government. And I'd been working <coughs> on Tribune, which was exactly the ideas are opposed to that. So to go on to Beaverbrook's paper was very different. Auf dem Wilhelmplatz. On March the 19th in Berlin, there was jubilation as Hitler celebrated his seizure of Czechoslovakia. His seemingly insatiable ambitions provoked growing outrage in Britain. Those working behind the scenes towards a diplomatic solution faced an increasingly difficult task. At the end of March, with fears that the German army was getting ready to move once again, the British government made what some believed to be a fatal mistake. Intelligence reports had suggested that Hitler's next target would be Poland. To try to deter Hitler, Chamberlain took the momentous decision to give a guarantee to Poland. He promised that Britain would come to Poland's aid if her independence was threatened. Well, our assurances to Poland are clear and precise. And although we should be glad to see <coughs> the differences between Poland and Germany amicably settled by discussion, although we think that they could and should be so settled, if an attempt were made to change the situation by force in such a way as to threaten Polish independence? Why then, that would inevitably start a general conflagration in which this country would be involved. Hitler's claims began with the former German port of Danzig. Many people thought the claim to Danzig reasonable since 95% of the city's population was German. The Poles feared Danzig would lead to further demands, but with the British guarantee, the Poles had less need to compromise with Hitler. That was the most reckless guarantee ever given by British government. It placed peace or war in the hands of a reckless, saber-rattling uh, military dictatorship. Dis dis despised and disliked, in the words of the British Foreign Office, by every Pole. A <coughs> British commentator, Stephen King Hall, who was strongly opposed to Hitler, was so moved by his dislike of that regime that he said, if Hitler were to invade Poland, I would cry Sieg Heil. And the Poles had the stupidity to believe that if it came to war, Polish cavalry would be in Berlin in a matter of weeks. <laughs> On the 20th of April, for Hitler's 50th birthday celebrations, 
the Nazis put on an intimidating display of military might. Hitler told Ribbentrop to invite as many cowardly foreigners as possible. Then he said, I will show them a parade of the most modern of all armed forces. In Britain, the government continued to work for peace, but told the public to prepare for war. If you hear the siren call, then it's probably me. And I've got a room or two, a radio that's new, an alarm clock that won't let you down. And I've got central heat, but to make it complete, I've got the deepest shelter in town. The calls to step up war preparations and take a tougher line with Hitler were led by maverick Tory backbencher Winston Churchill. Military weakness in this country encourages potential enemies. Anyone can see that public opinion is growing in favor of compulsory national service in all its forms and especially in the highest form. On the 26th of April, Chamberlain brought in compulsory military service. He did so in response to public opinion, but with some reluctance. Chamberlain's strategy, I think, is twofold. First of all, by introducing conscription, it is to send out the message to Hitler that the British are not bluffing. The second is to continue via diplomatic means to try to secure further measures of, of what it's impossible not to call appeasement at this point, because what Chamberlain is saying to Hitler is if you have legitimate grievances, we can still meet them. If you've got problems with Germany's lost colonies, we can do something about that. We can hand out to you favorable trade agreements, but not while you're misbehaving. So in other words, what he's doing is he's offering Hitler both stick and carrot. Throughout the summer, Chamberlain wrote regularly to his two sisters. The correspondence reveals his innermost thoughts. 10th of June. I can't help thinking that Hitler is not such a fool as some hysterical people make out, and that he would not be sorry to compromise if he could do so without what he would feel to be humiliation. The man who tried hardest to reach that compromise was Sir Neville Henderson. Britain's ambassador in Berlin. Chamberlain had told him to work as sympathetically as possible with the Nazis to secure peace. Henderson, I knew him very, very well. Henderson was for the British Empire and he was convinced that a Second World War, the Empire couldn't survive. It would be the breaking up of the empire and for that reason he was really wanting to come to an agreement with Germany. From the British Embassy in Berlin, Henderson sent telegrams urging that economic concessions should be made to the Nazis. And it was in this spirit that the Treasury agreed to hand over to Germany six million pounds in gold belonging to Czechoslovakia which had been kept at the Bank of England. But when the gold was transferred in May, there were furious protests in Parliament and the press. Despite this, peace initiatives continued behind the scenes. Throughout the summer, an extraordinary and little-known series of meetings took place. The most interesting one of them was the meeting between uh, a gentleman called Dr. Voltat, who was a sort of emissary of Goering's, um, who was involved in the International Whaling Commission, of all the odd things, but he came to London and he uh, engaged himself, in July this was, uh, in talks with a junior government minister called Hudson. And Hudson made an offer which was to the effect that if Germany 
disarmed, the British would restore their colonies, give them a huge loan, and come to various other economic agreements favorable to Germany with them. These negotiations were meant to take place under conditions of strict secrecy. But the ambitious Hudson, hoping for political glory, indiscreetly boasted about them to the press. The concessions he had offered provoked widespread anger. But Chamberlain still thought more private peace initiatives might work. 30th July. Hudson's gaffe has done a lot of harm. But in the meantime, there are other and discreeter channels by which contact can be maintained. It is important that those in Germany who would like to see us come to an understanding should not be discouraged. <laughs> In an effort to maintain that contact, a remarkable secret mission was dispatched in early August. A group of British businessmen went to meet Goering, overlord of the German economy. They travelled by separate routes to avoid attention. Dear Tom, it is just one week ago since we set out on a mission which for audacity is probably unequalled in political life. When I reread last night all the documents, it was just like an Edgar Wallace story. Susan Mensforth, niece of one of the businessmen, has recently found records which had lain undisturbed for 60 years in the family attic. I cannot tell you whether our party had personal orders from Mr Chamberlain. That is a rather delicate matter. I prefer not to discuss it. The seven of us were asked by the Foreign Office to go to Germany as private individuals. Our business was to put the British point of view. Contact was arranged by a Swedish businessman. Birger Dalerus, former head of Electrolux and a friend of Goering's. The meeting took place in a farmhouse in the very far north of Germany. That uh, land was in the hands of my mother, who after marrying uh, Mrs. Dalerus had become Swedish. So he could say that now we can uh, raise the Swedish flag and say that you don't meet on German ground, you meet on Swedish ground. Dalerus photographed Goering arriving at the station. My uncle thought that Goering was very vain. In fact, Goering turned up at the meeting, not in military uniform, but wearing a blue-grey suit, a silk shirt, red tie and suede shoes. He also felt that Goering was very frank, very honest and sincere and that he had an unswerving loyalty to Hitler. The meeting lasted three days. The aim was to let Hitler know that Britain was prepared to fight, but they hoped to reach a peaceful settlement over Danzig. Goering doodled ferociously throughout. My uncle summarized Goering's main points at the meeting that Danzig settlement must come sooner or later and must be negotiated by England or Poland, but not both. Danzig was the last territorial aim in Europe. Goering's dislike of the Foreign Office, his realisation that in a war England had all to lose and nothing to gain, and the necessity for establishing clearly defined spheres of influence. After the meeting, the British businessmen felt they had helped to avert war. So did Birger Dalerus. He said that this war just can't be allowed to start because it would be a catastrophe for the whole of Europe. So that was his sort of uh, ultimate vision, what could come out of a war between the two big industrial countries who, which he had known from inside. The meeting may have persuaded Goering that the British were prepared to fight, but Hitler was convinced that Britain wouldn't and saw the secret diplomacy as a sign of weakness. Hitler seemed all-powerful, but he did have secret opponents in top military and official positions, and they too wanted to avert war. Among them was an aristocratic young diplomat who'd been educated in Britain and still had influential friends there. His name 
was Adam von Trott. I first met Adam von Trott in the porch of Balliol College, Oxford, in October 1931. That's two years before Hitler came to power. And Germany was already a disturbed place. Uh, I became a close friend of his and was there with him when Hitler did come to power. And I saw it had the most uh, drastic effect on him. While working at the German Foreign Office, Trott conspired with other anti-Nazis in a last-ditch bid to prevent war. In the summer of 1939, he paid a visit to Clifton, the family home of his friend David Astor. Trott used the Astor connection to secure a private meeting with Chamberlain. Under the peace plan he brought with him, Germany would restore Czech independence in return for Danzig. But Chamberlain thought the plan impractical, and so Britain lost the last faint chance of preserving peace through the German opposition to Hitler. Trott was really attempting the impossible in trying to get Hitler back on friendly terms. I don't think Chamberlain could have made such an offer without falling, and I don't think Hitler would have accepted it. Across the country, amateur peacemakers were joining in the search for a settlement. All sorts of schemes were put together which might yet prevent a conflict in Europe. Some were sent to the Foreign Secretary, Lord Halifax. There were quite a large number of well-meaning crackpots who uh, wrote into Halifax to say that the war could be averted, especially over the Danzig problem, if you um, built bridges or uh, diverted the river Vistula so it went through Lithuania and uh, other ideas like this. They all believed that they were the only ones that knew the extraordinary secret of how to avert World War II. Um, they all got very polite letters back but uh, none of their schemes were at all practicable. There has been a grand response to Earl Baldwin's appeal for funds to assist refugees from Germany. To some, Hitler's persecution of the Jews provided a moral cause worth fighting for but many felt the plight of the Jews had nothing to do with Britain. And on the far right, British anti-Semites strengthened the peace lobby. Oswald Mosley's British Union of Fascists, which modeled itself on Mussolini's movement, had no sympathy for those they called refugees. They crusaded against going to war on their behalf. In a rally at Earl's Court in London on the 16th of July, 1939, Mosley told an enthusiastic 20,000 strong audience that Britain should mind its own business. He ridiculed the idea that Britain had a moral duty to go to war if a German kicks a Jew across the Polish frontier. One young Jewish refugee who faced prejudice when she arrived in Britain was Sylvia Rogers. My mother and I were once standing at a bus stop waiting for I don't know which bus. And there was, uh, is it a bill that was fastened onto the, the, the bus stop? and this was repeated at other places in London, saying, we don't want this war because we don't want a Jewish war. We don't want to go to war for the sake of the Jews, and that was actually pretty crushing. By the end of July, what Hitler called his war of nerves against the Poles was hotting up. He gave orders for military maneuvers and border incidents. Oxford student Edward Heath spent his summer holiday touring Central Europe. While we were in Poland, uh, while we were in Warsaw, we used to go each morning at 11 o'clock to a hotel, the main hotel called the Europejski. And that was where um, everybody gathered, the members of the press gathered and uh, people from the embassies gathered and so on. And we went and joined them to find out what the latest news was. Well, at that time we were advised to get out because it was all looking so dangerous. Britain's last real chance of maintaining peace was to come to an agreement with Russia. Recent evidence from the Russian archives reveals that an alliance between Britain, France and Russia was a serious possibility. 
caught between Stalin's Red Army on the one side and Western forces on the other, Hitler might have been deterred. I just have a hunch that there is a better chance of his being deterred by that than by the guarantees that, that we gave to various countries. I think the, 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 the idea of, of, in, of encirclement, of war on two fronts, um, that was a serious uh, uh, bogey in the minds of, a, of any German strategist or politician, even Hitler. But Chamberlain loathed Bolshevism, distrusted Stalin, and doubted the strength of the Red Army. Earlier talks with the Russians had not gone well. I can't make up my mind whether the Bolshevists are double-crossing us and trying to make difficulties, or whether they are only showing the cunning and sophistication of the peasant. On the whole, I incline to the latter view. Nevertheless, by August, Chamberlain reluctantly agreed to send a military mission to hold staff talks with the Russians. The French were eager to reach a deal, but Chamberlain chose obscure officials, told them to proceed with caution, and sent them by the slowest route possible. The discussions over the Anglo-Russian pact move a stage further with the arrival in the capital of the British and French service missions for the staff talks. The British delegation is headed by Admiral Sir Reginald Plunkett Ernley Earl Drax, and the French by General Dumont. They are met at the station by a whole lot of charming Russian gentlemen with quite unpronounceable names. So where so far the politicians seem to have failed, perhaps the military experts will succeed in adjusting the different points of view of two powerful nations, each determined to maintain the peace and freedom of Europe. And the negotiations were disastrous from the very start. Poor old Drax had dressed up for the Russian winter in a great big full dress uniform and it turned out to be as hot as hell in Moscow at that particular time. Drax had a weak throat and the moment they got into this great big hall, Voroshilov lit up the most vile kind of Russian cigarette which wafted smoke in, in uh, Drax's direction so he found he could barely talk. And then Voroshilov asked for his credentials. Well, he hadn't got any credentials. Um, and so it was a fiasco and a farce from the, fr from the word go. Chamberlain went on holiday on the 6th of August confident that with or without a Russian agreement, his policy towards Germany would avert war. But while Britain took to the beaches, the German Foreign Minister Ribbentrop pulled off an amazing coup. On the 22nd of August, he flew to Moscow and made a deal with Soviet Russia, under the noses of the British and French negotiators. Hitler had outmaneuvered us, and uh, instead of having a British delegation of any substance in Moscow to make a treaty with them, we'd sent along some uh, Tupney Hapney officials who didn't weren't serious, whereas Hitler sent along his uh, Ribbentrop, and Ribbentrop had s signed the document with Stalin. It was a terrible moment in the history of uh, the country of Europe, and at uh, that time many people despaired almost. They said we'd never have a democratic victory in, in, the, in Europe again. Hitler had outsmarted the British. With the pact, he'd stopped the Russians from resisting his planned attack on Poland. And he was increasingly confident that Britain wouldn't fight either. The Prime Minister, walking in the park with Mrs Chamberlain, is faced with another situation requiring all the gifts of statesmanship. Members of the Cabinet arrive for the meeting to consider the announcement from Berlin of a German-Soviet non-aggression pact. You know their faces as well as I do. You can read in them concern, but no indecision. After the meeting, a statement was issued that Britain's policy is unchanged, her pledges to Poland remain. Symbolic of Britain's attitude, the policeman outside number 10 continues to survey a troubled world with determination. The last major opportunity to deter Hitler had failed. By the last days of August, Britain was bracing itself for war. At St. Bartholomew's Hospital in London, medical students filled sandbags. 
At Canterbury, the cathedral's stained glass windows were removed. The National Gallery's masterpieces were taken down and sent to Welsh mines for safekeeping. But the Foreign Office doves had not given up. Making his final effort, Sir Neville Henderson became the center of public attention. He still hoped a compromise could be worked out over Danzig. He took a message to Berlin, saying that the Poles had been persuaded to negotiate. At Westminster Abbey, the king and his brothers go to pray for peace. The king leads his people in their prayers that right and justice may prevail without recourse to war. George VI was an ardent supporter of Chamberlain's peace policies. He, like the rest of the country, waited to see if last-minute diplomacy could save the peace. Back to Britain comes our ambassador to Germany, Sir Neville Henderson bringing a message from the man who must decide between war and peace. Sir Neville arrives in a plane placed at his disposal by the German government and reports immediately to the Prime Minister and His Majesty the King. As silent crowds watch him in Downing Street, the world still waits to know what message he brings. I found the Foreign Office in a turmoil, with Sir Neville Henderson due back from Berlin by air at 12 o'clock. He was late as the car from Croydon broke down. We are still urging Germany and Poland to negotiate, though the Germans seem determined to have their way and are as unaccommodating as possible. All day, we were on a seesaw. Peace, war, peace. On the whole, I think Hitler believed that the British would not come in to a war to defend Poland. He'd been hearing so much from the secret emissaries about conciliation, about concession, that he felt that in the last resort there would be a kind of Polish Munich and that Chamberlain would back away from it. And on the very eve of war, on the 31st of August, 1939, a German admiral said to him, well, surely the British will come in and they will fight. And Hitler said, I seem to hear the beat of the wings of the angel of peace. At dawn on the 1st of September 1939, the German battleship Schleswig-Holstein, on a courtesy visit to Danzig, fired the opening shots of the Second World War. But British diplomats were slow to accept what was happening. Claire Hollingworth was on the border. I got through to our embassy and a young diplomat, I told a young diplomat there that the um, war had begun and the tanks were coming in. And he said, Claire, don't talk such rubbish or words to that effect. Negotiations are still going on. So I said, they're not, as far as I'm concerned, because the tanks are outside. And I put the telephone outside the window and said, can't you hear them? And he had to admit, of course, that he could hear the noisy tanks coming in. But Britain was not yet at war. Chamberlain hesitated. Reports from Rome suggested that a last-minute peace conference might still be arranged but the House of Commons would have none of it. This time, of course, Chamberlain is, is constrained by his own cabinet and by his own parliamentary party. Uh, when uh, the backbenchers, and even when some of his own cabinet, learn that there are moves afoot for a diplomatic solution, he is faced with a political revolt from his own ranks. So this time, there won't be a last-minute intervention by Mussolini to pull the irons out of the fire for him. The cabinet and the appeasers were discouraged by the reception that the insane House of Commons gave to this glimmer of peace. The cabinet sat long, terrific excitement, 
The PM came out of a side room. He looked well, almost relieved that the dread decision was taken and the appalling battle on. We were going to give Germany only two hours ultimatum. The cabinet had insisted. I decided to go home. There were no cars. The rain was blinding. Cabinet ministers, chiefs of staff, all wandered hopelessly about. We left Rab with the PM, who was about to go to bed for his last night of peace. Wet typists trotted off into the downpour. Only people emerging from number 10 knew the facts. I'm home. I shall not sleep. In a few hours we shall be at war, and the PM will have lost his great battle for peace. I am speaking to you from the cabinet room at 10 Downing Street. This morning, the British ambassador in Berlin handed the German government a final note stating that unless we heard from them by 11 o'clock, that they were prepared at once to withdraw their troops from Poland, a state of war would exist between us. I have to tell you now that no such undertaking has been received and that consequently this country is at war with Germany. There's a sort of choking in his voice. There is a, an air of desolation about that speech. And it's, it's a man who has given everything to avoid war. The final long drawn out agonies that preceded the actual declaration of war were as nearly unendurable as could be. It was, of course, a grievous disappointment that peace could not be saved. But I know that my persistent efforts have convinced the world that no part of the blame can lie here. Chamberlain's devastation was shared by all those who'd worked for conciliation. But their different approaches had been contradictory. And above all, Hitler had proved incalculable. Part of the problem was uh, the nature of Hitler himself. If he had been a classic German statesman on the Bismarck mold, say, then one could have done a deal with him. Somewhere along the line, the war could have been averted. But he wasn't. He had a view of, um, um, a racial view of the domination of uh, the German over everybody else in Europe that meant that there really was no alternative. Uh, well, there was, in a way, a moral imperative for going to war against Hitler, but, of course, states very seldom go to war for moral reasons. And I think we should not deceive ourselves that we went to war uh, for the sake of the Jews or to, uh, uh, to fight a, a, a monstrous racist tyrant. Uh, that would have been a good moral reason for going to war with Hitler, but it wasn't the reason that we went to war with him. We went to war with him because we regarded him as a threat to our very existence as a nation. The orthodox view that it was in Britain's interest to go to war has hardly changed for 60 years. Until recently, the scale of the sacrifice required to defeat Hitler has made it unacceptable to question the rights and wrongs of the war. Did we really have to fight? Well, we saw what the Nazis did to their own country, how they treated their people. and. Uh, to a certain extent, though we didn't realize the whole extent, the persecution of the Jews. And we were horrified by this. But there, you can say that was an internal affair. But the second thing which horrified us was the way he was gobbling up the countries of Europe. We wouldn't have stood a chance against him. Just 20 miles across the channel, that's all. And he had all these resources. No, it couldn't possibly have worked. Well, Hitler has been variously described as a tyrannical megalomaniac with uh, limitless ambitions. That is not the case. His ambitions were quite clearly set out in Mein Kampf uh, before the, he came to power. The significant point about his ambitions, though, well, they were not limitless. He said himself he had no quarrel with Britain. Britain had its empire. That was of no concern to Hitler. What he wanted was to prevent interference with his aims in Central and Eastern Europe. After Poland, his intention was to turn against Russia. He wanted to destroy Bolshevism and create a great empire of grain and raw materials to complete a great industrial empire in Europe. 
Mein Kampf is not a diatribe of hate against Britain and the British Empire. It's a diatribe of hate against Jews. It's a diatribe of hate against Slavs. Hitler wanted to win the thousand-year struggle between the Teuton and the Slavs. It was not in Britain's national interests to get involved in that age-old conflict. We should have stayed out of it. Hitler's pact with Russia did not last, and the crucial battles were fought on the Eastern Front. The conflict between Nazism and Communism raises tantalizing questions. What would have happened if the Western democracies had stayed out, and the two most vicious systems in the world had fought each other on their own? Hitler would then have been free to do whatever he wished in the East, and he would have attacked the Russians in the sure knowledge that he was going to have no trouble from us or from the French. And I think he would then almost certainly have beaten the Russians. He would have secured control of the whole Eurasian landmass, and then he would have turned back and defeated us overwhelmingly, and we'd have had no means possibly of standing up against him. If he did go east, who's to say he wouldn't have won? And uh, if he didn't win, then who's to say that Stalin wouldn't have dominated the whole of uh, the European landmass? Either way, it would have been completely disastrous for our continued independence. The fact was that both fascism and communism posed horrific threats to British independence in the 20th century, and um, by not standing up to Hitler in 1939, one of them would have won. What would have happened is that the Nazis would have lost as they did, but the Soviet regime not being able to be helped by the British and the Americans landing at D-Day and landing in Italy, the Soviets would have been bled white. The Soviet regime would have collapsed. There would have been no Cold War. There would have been no shadow of the mushroom cloud. And those broad sunlit uplands that Churchill talked about in 1940 may actually have existed, as it was, of course, in 1945, Britain emerged not into some sunlit uplands, but into the most uncertain future with the Soviet menace dominating Europe and indeed the world throughout the entire Cold War period. In 1945, Britain celebrated a glorious victory, but the country was virtually bankrupt and would soon lose its empire. In the final reckoning was the cost too high. Had we not gone to war with Hitler, there would not have been a single Jew alive today in Europe. You would have had many more killed than the six million who um, eventually met their um, deaths. You would also have had vast populations of Slavs being um, massacred or turned into slaves. It's a um, extraordinary idea really that anyone should be questioning whether or not we should have gone to war in 1939. I think going to war against Hitler in 1939 was a mistake. It was foolish of us to have got involved in the Czechoslovak crisis and equally in the Hitler's dispute with Poland. It's not to defend Hitler, it's saying simply what was our national interest. If Hitler was then going to destroy himself by attacking a much greater and more ruthless power, Russia, uh, not intervening would have spared us the cost of the Second World War, which is very considerable, and avoided, in particular, the deaths of 400,000 um, Britishers. Most may still think Britain had to fight, but the debate is now open. And Channel 4's World War II season continues next with John Mills and Sylvia Sims in Ice Cold in Alex, preceded by a fascinating look into the making of...